Don't turn that dial. If you do, you're going to miss a really, really good show because we have as our guest Professor Nick Stephanopoulos. He is a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. And as everybody would know, we're talking about constitutional law, which basically covers the world. So whether you're talking about abortion, whether you're talking about voting rights, whether you're talking about campaign finance and guns, really, the United States Supreme Court, some would say, is the most powerful entity in the Western world. Just think about that. Don't turn that station here. You miss a really, 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 really good show. It's possible that this could have... You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name and politics is our game. And we will, in a sense, be doing a lot of politics and public policy this evening because we'll, in large part, be discussing the United States Supreme Court. Now, a lot of people learn that the United States Supreme Court, these nine people, used to say nine men, but we no longer say that, they put on their robes, they sit down. Did, they, did I bring it? Oh, I hope I did, yes. You can see, I learned, don't leave home without it. This is the dog-eared copy of my US Constitution. Okay. And so people think, if you're on the Supreme Court, you know, you don't think about politics. You simply start with this document, some would say, not Judge Posner, we'll get to that. <laughs> you start with this document, you construe the uh, U.S. Constitution, and you don't play politics, and you try to come up with the best decision you can. But I think we'll find out <clears throat> from Professor Nick Stompanopoulos that's not really the way it works. There's a lot of politicking going on, and maybe none of the Supreme Court justices really start with this document that I so revere, the U.S. Constitution. So let me start right there. Is it pretty much a political game that's being played by the United States nine Supreme Court members? I wouldn't say it's just politics. I would say that uh, you're starting with a, a constitutional text that is really vague and really abstract in a lot of its key phrases. So when you have language like the freedom of speech or equal protection or due process, those kinds of terms don't really define themselves. Well, what is it? A First Amendment. <clears throat> you know, I'm not going to test you to see if you get every <laughs> word right. But in essence, what does the First Amendment say regarding freedom of speech? So it's protecting the right of the freedom of speech. It says Congress shall pass no law abridging the freedom of speech. So you start with that really high-level abstract text. But it's a restraint on Congress. Because a lot of people, lay people who aren't lawyers, they say, oh, we've got the right of free speech. You can't stop me from speaking. It's Congress can't. I mean, you, Nick Stephanopoulos, could try to stop somebody. But the law, the, really, the major restraint when, in the First Amendment is on Congress passing a law that restrains freedom of speech. Is that right? That's right under the First Amendment itself, but then under subsequent amendments, they've interpreted the First Amendment as also applying to the states. And that would be the 14th Amendment exactly. and the 5th Amendment, or, or just the 14th? Just the 14th to okay. apply the First to, Amendment to, to the, the states. states. And then somehow it goes, the federal government, the states, and now since it applies to the states, are the municipalities and entities that are, uh, are governing entities within that state, are they covered as well? They're covered as well because the view is so that Cook all County counties... So Cook County government is, and the city of Chicago. So basically, it's every federal, state, county, local government is restrained from restraining your freedom of speech unreasonably, right? Every state actor uh, is limited from abridging the freedom of speech. There's a whole convoluted body of law that says what exactly is a First Amendment violation, what isn't. Okay. Uh, but a, a good way to sum it up is to say that unreasonable violations aren't allowed. And then it, who decides whether it's reasonable or unreasonable? So the courts decide in lawsuits uh, what's reasonable and what's not. And when you say the courts, what's the rough breakdown here? Because if somebody's watching this, they haven't gone to law school. When you say the courts, you mean the federal courts and the state courts, right? Right. So we have two court systems in the country. Uh, every state has its own state court system. And then uh, operating parallel to that, we also have the federal judiciary. And uh, at the federal level, we have the, uh, a network of about 100 trial courts that are located all around the country. And then we have a dozen or so courts of appeal. 
So right now here in Chicago, we're sitting in the Seventh Circuit, which is headquartered uh, here in the city. And then on top of the 12 courts of appeal, we have the United States Supreme Court that is at the very top of the pyramid. Okay, and, and, and altogether there are about 900 judges, starting with the district court or trial judges, then a much smaller number of judges on the appellate level, as you said, and then the smallest level, the nine Supreme Court justices. That's about right. right. Uh, six or 700 trial court judges, right. another 150, 200 uh, appellate judges, and then just the nine members of the court at the top. And they are all, <clears throat> according to this document, right, the U.S. Constitution, they are all appointed by the by the President of the United States? Does exactly. it say that in the U.S. Constitution? It does say that. With the, the advice and consent of the Senate, right? With the advice and consent of the Senate. Which means? Which means that the Senate has to vote to approve uh, every presidential nomination of a judge. Now, by, by what custom it's evolved that the two senators, U.S. senators in a specific state, have a lot of sway in terms of advising the President who to start out, that is, who to appoint who to nominate, because basically he nominates people, but since it has to be approved by the Senate, they basically confirm these folks. Yeah, and that's and those two, is that just custom where those two U.S. Senators have that much power? It's purely custom. It's also evolved quite a bit over time. So in earlier periods, the two home state Senators had more say. Uh, more and more in the last 20, 30 years, the White House has just consolidated control over picks itself. So these days, they'll still likely consult with the home state senators, but they won't let the home state senators pick the judges uh, the, the way they used to. the district court, they have a lot of sway, the state, the U.S. senators, right? Or does the president get really involved in those as well, the district court judges? It won't be the judges? president himself getting or involved. His staff, It'll be I mean, people in the White yeah. House, people in right. the Justice Department, okay. uh, still with consultation with the local senators. It, it, basically, they're political. It's seldom, it's, it's infrequent that a Democratic that a president will appoint somebody who is not viewed as within his party, whether it's district, whether it's appellate, and certainly the Supreme Court. Would that be right? Uh, that's right, but it's uh, people from all corners of the party. So a Democratic president might uh, appoint very liberal judges and very center-left judges. And a Republican president might appoint sort of Tea Party zealots and also some center-right moderates. So what, when the president sits down to make these appointments, are these people who've generally donated money, who've worked on behalf of the party, uh, who have supported candidates? Uh, I'm not saying they're not qualified. They've gone to law school. It would be unheard of. I don't know if it's required, but it would be unheard of to. It's not required, but it would be unheard of these days to appoint somebody, for the president to appoint somebody who had not gone to law school. And most likely he or she would have practiced law, especially if it's a trial court judge, right? Yeah, I would say most nominees have some sort of political connection, but most aren't active political career people either. You know, they're, they're prosecutors, they're government attorneys, they're law professors. But the, the connection would be what? What kind of political connection might they have? Maybe just social ties. Uh, okay. I think that's often how it is. They, uh, but also somebody in their family may have donated money. Somebody has done something. <clears throat> so if it's a Democrat, somebody says, hey, that guy's a Democrat or that woman's a Democrat, or if it's a Republican doing the appointing, that person's a Democrat, right? I mean, they, they've got some way of doing that, and therefore, it starts that, although on the district court level, they may not be uh, closely aligned ide ideologically with the president, they're more often than not a dem aligned some way, more likely with Republicans, if it's a Republican doing the appointing. Right? Or same thing with the Yeah, there, there's no doubt that the ideology... It's the short of a, short of a point I'm trying to make. It is a part of a political process, this appointment. Am I right on that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I wouldn't right. say it's purely partisan, but it's certainly political it's in part the, the broader that. sense. And so jumping way ahead, we'll come back to this, but, you know, we don't want to keep people in suspense completely. <laughs> I think it's your view. You and I discussed some of these things just a few days ago. We met, uh, I saw you speak. Mm -hmm. Really nice speech on the Voting <laughs> Rights Act much. at the University of Chicago runs a thing called, well, loop luncheons, and they have a f first Monday every year. Right. So it's the first Monday of the Supreme Court term, and you were speaking about the Voting Rights Act. Right? Exactly. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> so is, in, in our conversations, I've picked up, and I've been somewhat surprised by the views that you sort of openly say this is a somewhat political process, the Supreme Court dis body, because you said, right now, we'll, we'll get to this, but the Supreme Court, there's a block that's conservative, 
and there's a block that's liberal, and there's a judge who's a swing judge. That would be, some people would call it the Kennedy Court because mm -hmm, he goes mm -hmm. both ways, sometimes conservative, sometimes liberal, more often than not conservative. But my point, <clears throat> I was struck when you said, well, you know, you know the, the, Republic, the conservatives on the court might want to reach out and take cases that allow them to strengthen their precedent because they're concerned that you know, with president, Democrats winning the presidency often, there may come a time soon when an opening will occur, which would change the ideological composition of the court, and that might be made, that appointment made by a Democrat, not a Republican. And so the more of their position strengthen occurs, the more of the so-called conservative view that's strengthened, the, the, the longer their, their <coughs> the longer their impact as a conservative justice. So, and, and similarly, the, the liberals are thinking of ways in which they can jockey for position to strengthen their power. So you really, you know, I, I was really naive. I went to law school, at the University of Chicago Law School, and I sort of thought of this as about this. And what you're telling me is, yeah, it's some of this, but it's, it's also a lot politics in terms of strengthening one ideology relative to another. Yeah, I wouldn't call it's it. Rather long I, I wouldn't, question, I wouldn't call you see it. What I'm saying? Sure, I wouldn't call it politics. You know, pure and simple. I would say that the Constitution is a really vague document, and so a lot of different ideologies and a lot of different philosophies are consistent with the constitutional language. So you put it to me, it ain't math because math is a very precise thing. Two and two are four. Three times two are six. But you said, "Con law in math." Is that exactly. what you meant by right. you, you take a phrase it's like, very subjective. You take a phrase like due process. You know, how does due process mean that you settle a dispute involving uh, abortion or the death penalty or what have you? You know, there's there's a lot of uh, history and values uh, and precedent that has to go into the decision too. And so different justices have different approaches, uh, and they'll and they'll push for those approaches when they're interpreting this really vague, really abstract document that we start with. Well, does it extend to, people might remember Gore v. Bush. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a very close election in 2000. So close, it was litigated through the courts. The, the decision in terms of how best to count the votes, essentially, in Florida. Would that be the way exactly. to Exactly, right. And it came, it made its way starting in state court, but then made its way to the U.S. Supreme Court that dispute, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and people, I think it went on 35 days, something like that. Before it was finished in December, it's about a month The U.S. Supreme after Court eventually stepped in and said, it's over, the counting should be over. At this point, they didn't have to say it, but when the counting was over, at that, when they stopped the counting of the votes, Bush was ahead, right? right. And they now, stopped it before a full recount could take place throughout the state of Florida. Do you think the, and, and that vote to stop the counting, was a five to four vote, right? It was, that's right. And it happened to be the five so-called conservative justices relative to the four liberals, right? So was that a, a political vote? Was that the five conservatives saying, we want to continue to advance the conservative point of view, and if Gore is appointed, well, possibly he'll have an opportunity to make a Supreme Court justice appointment, either because a justice passes away or retires, and that could change the composition of the court. The five conservatives didn't want that to happen. So they found a way, some would say, to found a way to interpret, to make, to decide this case, not based simply on the US Constitution and the case law, but wanting it to come out for George W. Bush. You know, it's so hard to know what the motives ever are of justices. Well, what's your suspicion? Just give me your gut. My suspicion is that, so what's, what's suspicious in Bush v. Gore specifically is that the reason the court gave for stopping the recount isn't a reason that ever had come up in equal protection or in ballot counting cases before. So I do think it's suspicious when the court comes up with a new cause of action, a new theory in this particular case uh, and that happens. This is, because it's the U.S. Supreme Court, it's not bound completely by precedent. If you're a lower court, you are, but because you're the Supremes, you know, Diana Ross and the Supremes, because you are supreme, you, get, you can do that. You, in a sense, have unbridled, unbridled power. Is that right? Uh, unbridled power over the construction of the Constitution, right. I think, is a fair and you're statement. Saying, so it hadn't been, they hadn't used this approach previously, but it's not obviously, I'm suggesting it's political, but it's not obviously political. They may have just said, 
this is an approach that makes sense in this case. So the Constitution says equal protection. Uh, the court in Bush v. Gore said that equal protection also means uh, counting disputed ballots in the same way everywhere in a state. Uh, that's not a crazy application of the idea of equal protection. What's a little problematic is that if this is such an obvious idea, you would have thought it would have come up before Bush v. Gore too. So are you saying in your gut you think the five really wanted to perpetuate the ideological view they have, so they wanted to keep the five going. They, in a sense, wanted to decide this in a way that George W. Bush would come out the president. I would say the five didn't decide the case based on the best reading of the court's precedent before Bush v. Gore. And from that, you can infer that something unusual was going on. Do you think if it, everything had been switched, the Democrats or the liberals, I shouldn't say the Democrats, the liberals, would have done the same thing? That is, their thirst for perpetuating, and it's not their personal power, but their thirst for perpetuating their ideological point of view might have gotten the best of them. It's not a conservative so, liberal thing. It's more, you know, uh, it's really a tremendous, well, a tremendous desire to see one's idea, idea, ideology prevail. It's so hard to know. If it, I, I, I feel like I can't, I can't say that the, the, it would have okay. come out the exact same way if the shoe was on the other front. Okay. Who knows? So back to the basics. So we have these federal courts. We have the state courts. The federal courts sort of, they, they're supposed to defer to the state courts on state issues, but whenever there's a federal issue, the federal, this U.S. Supreme Court controls. Exactly. And, and in 1803, or thereabouts, Marbury v. Madison was decided and hard to think back several hundred years ago, but it wasn't clear when there was a dispute on interpreting legislation as to whether it was constitutional or not. It would seem obvious to us now that the U.S. the courts decide mm -hmm, the judiciary, mm -hmm. but at that time it wasn't, and Marbury B. Madison basically said, well, when there's that kind of a dispute, the judiciary will make that decision. So in a sense, the judiciary has control or a check over the legislature and over the executive of the president. So in a sense, although they didn't say it, Marbury v. Madison has stood for the principle that, well, we just saw that when we were talking about Gore v. Bush. When you have to go to the final word, it's what the Supreme Court says, not what the president, not what the legislature. Right, so Marbury, get that right? Marbury yeah. stands for the idea that the courts have the power of judicial review. Uh, the courts have the power to strike down actions by Congress or the president or the states uh, as unconstitutional. Uh, and it was a power that, that the court didn't use very often for the first few decades of its history, but over time it's become a more and more accepted power for okay. the court. And so when we look at this, I don't know if we can get it up on the screen to show there are nine lawyers, put up the names of the nine lawyers, and then we're going to take a look at them one by one and do a really quick, maybe 30 second thumbnail of, of these folks. But starting with Chief, Chief Justice Roberts, now he's a little, everybody's equal on the Supreme Court, but he's a little bit more equal than, than the others because he is the Chief Justice, right? So he gets you know, just one vote, but he gets to assign who writes the cases, and that itself gives him some substantial power. And uh, he's probably got there, he's 58 years old, so, and he was appointed a few years back, not too long ago, but he was a little bit younger. Right. Appointed, appointed of course, by Bush, George W. Bush, the 43rd president. Uh, but he was an advocate. He spent a lot of time arguing cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, probably more than any other justice before or after. Would that be right? I think that's right. Uh, Thurgood Marshall argued a whole bunch of cases, yeah. too. I'm not sure how Marshall stacks up against Roberts. But certainly more than anybody currently who's on the court. Absolutely. And he was also considered one of the very, very best oral advocates in America before he was appointed. So a man of enormous intellect, and some would say, I guess most would say, of enormous integrity. So despite the fact that Bush was looking around for a strong conservative, he also was looking around for somebody who could be sort of an intellectual leader and command respect. Would that be fair? I think Roberts is pretty close to the ideal pick for a Republican president. So uh, impeccable legal reputation, uh, and I think also impeccable conservative credentials. He was a, a Reaganite uh, lawyer in the 80s. He clerked for conservative uh, judges when he was younger. Uh, his memos that he's written in the past were quite conservative. So you have both the intellect and the unquestionable conservative ideology, too. And so going through this and staying with the same block, uh, Anton Scalia, who is also a man most would concede, I think, liberals even, although they're critical of his conservative 
positions and perspectives, they would concede he's a person of substantial intellectual depth. Right? right. There's no one, no one whose opinions are more fun to read on the court than Scalia. And he's an originalist, meaning he thinks he thinks you should look at the text of the Constitution, and you really can decide current cases by looking at this. So he's a believer in this. Right? He would say he's not a believer in the text only. He's a believer in the uh, original understanding of the text by people at the time the Constitution was drafted. So you can't just look at the words. You have to go back and look at the framers when they were writing this, what were their viewpoints, and interpret their words in the Constitution in the context that other writings that these people or speeches that they gave is that what you mean? Sure. So you might look at the Federalist Papers. You might look to how certain terms were used in uh, popular debates or in uh, legal uh, uh, disputes back in that era. So you would look to, to figure out how a certain term was commonly understood uh, either in 1787 or for other amendments in 1866, let's say. And, so, and he was appointed by Reagan. He was a Re yeah, Reagan appointee. And then Clarence Thomas, the only black mm -hmm. on the court now, and he's a conservative, so a lot of blacks who, on average, tend to be more liberal than conservative, certainly in the intellectual arena. Yeah, I take back that statement. In the intellectual arena, blacks intellectuals tend to be more liberal than conservative. Mm -hmm. So, and especially in the legal arena, so those blacks outside, uh, outside of the court have been very critical of Thomas because although black, he's conservative, and to them that makes him suspect. Well, I think that the critique of Thomas is less focused on his race. It's just disagreement with his ideology or his judicial philosophy. And you think that he got a lot of crit gets a lot of criticism from? Do many blacks who are liberal call him an Uncle Tom, because because in their view, although he's black, he doesn't subscribe to the liberal dogma. I don't think you see that you sort of that really? uh, personal. Did you see that at one point when he was? Is it at, at, the, at the point time? of his nomination, I think you saw okay. it. But I think ever since he's been a consistent. Uh, textualist and originalist. Oh, sure. I'm not saying that. Right, right. I'm talking about the liberals who, who can't, liberal blacks who can't, and even liberals who are white, can't get it in their head that a person can be an intelligent black conservative. I mean, you I don't think th there are many liberals who think? You don't there, think There that. might be some. I can't you speak don't for others. My, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't see Thomas okay. so differently from Scalia okay. or from Alito or Roberts. Okay. Now, and Thomas is 65, so still a relatively young man. He could be there another 25 years easily. 22 years in, I think. Scalia right. is getting up there. He's 77. Okay. Getting up there. He could also be there another 15 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Alito was appointed by George W. Bush, Bush 43. Exactly. And he was a solid conservative. Solid conservative, less flashy of a writer than either Scalia or uh, Roberts. Uh, also probably not quite as radical as Thomas or Scalia. Quite similar to Roberts, I think, in his temperament and his philosophy. And appointed right around the same time. Yeah, a year or two later. He's 63. So those are the, those are the four solid conservatives, Roberts, Scalia, Thomas, Alito. And then you have Kennedy, who's known as the swing vote. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes he's liberal, sometimes he's conservative, they now often call this the Kennedy court. Yeah, so we had the Kennedy court for the last seven or eight years. Okay. Before that, we had the O'Connor court. But Same now, thing. She was the swing vote. And so whichever she, way she went, the, 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 not always, but often that decided the exactly. opinion. So Kennedy's there. He was appointed by Reagan. He's 77. And then you've got the four liberals, right? Mm -hmm. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 80 years old, probably certainly their longest as the longest of that liberal block. That's right, by a couple years over Breyer. Okay. She would be the oldest. She's 80. Mm -hmm. She might. Be, she's had a bout with cancer. Two bouts with cancer. So if anybody were to resign thinking, you know, they want to make sure, right now she has a Democratic president, Obama, wanna, she might want to make sure, the courts are political, the Supreme Court's political, that Obama would have the chance to replace her. She might say, this is a good time to step down. Yeah, folks have made that argument in print that uh, Ginsburg should uh, consider her legacy, consider the, uh, the causes she believes in. There's a risk that all of those things could be set back uh, if she retires under a Republican president. She herself feels like she's still going strong and hasn't shown any inclination of uh, retiring. Breyer, 75, he's a liberal appointed by Clinton. Solid, he tends to look, you're saying, at what are the consequences of the opinion? Yeah, the most as opposed to looking at, say, starting as a text. He's the most so empirically forth. minded of the current justices. So he wants to know the data. He wants to know what the social science studies point to. 
he's of course interested in, and has philosophies about the, the text and the, the meaning of the, the Constitution, but is more of a pragmatist than other justices. And then the two most recent appointees, Kagan and Sotomayor, Kagan being, I think you said, the great liberal hope. I think that's right. So in terms of uh, credentials and writing ability and social networking skills, I think she's the most promising member of the, the liberal bloc on the court right now. And she can go toe to toe with Chief Justice Roberts in argument and writing. She's, would you say, even though she doesn't have his track record as an advocate before the Supreme Court, most would say she's pretty competent to take him on, he to her. Oh, absolutely. I think competent to take him on in terms of uh, both questions at oral argument, in terms of uh, strength of uh, logical force in her opinions, in terms of rhetoric, I think on every dimension. And Sotomayor is known as the first Hispanic on the court, mm -hmm. liberal, appointed by Obama, very young, 59. She'll be there a long time. So that's basically what we have. It's almost like looking at a baseball game. You've got these four <laughs> conservatives, you've got these four liberals, you've got Kennedy's a swing vote. You could worry about your baseball team, somebody's getting AIDS, somebody's frail in health, same thing people mm -hmm. are worried about Ginsburg <laughs> when she's gonna be replaced. Um, so it's really, it really is a political process. I mean, they're just sitting there jockeying in there. I mean, I keep thinking, oh no, 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 they were like, they study this thing. I mean, is there any, do you think there is one justice of these nine who follows what Gerhard Casper said when he taught con law at the University of Chicago? You know, put, folks, put this Constitution right here in your, in your coat pocket and don't leave home without it, you know, because I mean, you got something coming up in the law. You want to look at that and start there. I mean, I is there it, one justice who actually believes that? I would say all nine of the justices begin with the text and none of their decisions, uh, for the most part, are in uh, obvious conflict with the text. Uh, it's just that when the text is as broad as this particular text is, it can support lots and lots of different approaches. So the same text can be consistent both with a Scalia-esque originalist and with a Breyer-esque pragmatist and with a Thurgood Marshall uh, sort of uh, a flaming liberal. Like all of those approaches are consistent with the Constitution, I would say. And whether you're one or the other is not outcome determinative, you don't think? I think it's absolutely outcome determinative, but I think all of those approaches are consistent with the, the constitutional text. So I don't think that any of the justices are ignoring the text. I think they have different philosophies for how the text should be uh, interpreted and, and applied. So we've now given people a, sort of the broad framework, and then we had a recent application. The Voting Rights Act mm -hmm. was declared unconstitutional in a 5-4 vote. Right? Yep. A portion of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, landmark legislation to what? Landmark civil rights legislation. Try yeah, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, people said LBJ divided it up. Unlike Obama, he didn't go. Obama went for health care all in one fell swoop. LBJ said, okay, we'll have the Civil Rights Act in 64, 65, we'll have the Voting Rights Act. Very important in terms of making sure blacks, especially in the South, would have the opportunity to vote, run for office, et cetera. Yeah, the real focus of the Voting Rights Act was ending the problem of racial discrimination in voting. And that was a problem that was uh, not limited to, but concentrated in the, the Deep South. So let me go, Supreme Court, 5-4 vote, five conservatives counting Kennedy there, and four liberals going the other way, held, uh, Section 5 was unconstitutional. That basically said, what did it say? So Section 5 was one half of the Voting Rights Act. It said that certain states, mostly in the Deep South, had to get prior permission from the Department of Justice before they could amend any of their laws that have to do with elections. I'm just gonna say we're gonna continue to speak as a crow's rule. I'm so sorry we're gonna have to have we're going to have to have Justice Stephanopoulos back again, <laughs> but you've got about 30 seconds to get to the end. What happened in that decision? Was it right or wrong? Voting rights act. So the court said that the formula Congress used to pick which states are subject to Section 5 was obsolete, outdated, and so therefore the entire uh, path of the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional. Uh, in my view, it's dead wrong. I think that when Congress legislates on issues of racial discrimination,